Morning, Admiral. How are you? Doing great, Hugh. I'm in Atlanta today to do a couple of book events for uh, 2054. Excellent. How is 2054 doing? I, it's doing great. We're uh, kind of floating around top 50 on the combined Amazon fiction, nonfiction list. And uh, I think we've moved uh, close to 20,000 copies in about two and a half weeks. So uh, it's I not think what's going to happen, but it's pretty good. Yeah, I think what's going to happen is as we go into the summer reading season, which gets started about Memorial Day, people are going to reach for that. But but we will come back to that then. Admiral, what years were you the Supreme Allied Commander? 2009 to 2013, Hugh. Okay, so it's 10 years after our errant bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. And uh, a decade later, was that still an issue with which you were aware and had to deal with the after effects of? Yes. Um, in fact, when I went to Belgrade, uh, the uh, Serbians would literally drive me past uh, the buildings that had been struck. Um, they kept them as a kind of like memorial uh, to the event. And it, it, it remains uh, high in the consciousness, uh, certainly of the people on the ground in Serbia. Because we've had two overnight, two big strikes. Israel struck the Iranian embassy in Syria, killing at least two IRGC generals and five other senior staffers who had been uh, plotting with Hezbollah and maybe Hamas. And then seven aid workers were killed in what is probably an IDF errant strike last night. Can you explain to us how such strikes can happen both intentionally with such precision and unintentionally with such damage to Israel's reputation, though it's a war and everyone understands that. Yeah, this is uh, the two faces of war. You think of the Roman god Janus, whose two faces, peace and war. Um, here you have an entirely evil and malevolent gathering of high-level terrorists, uh, and I would include the Iranians, uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, all floating around that embassy in Damascus, which has become kind of uh, the planning central for Hezbollah, Hamas. I'm sure they discussed the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. So malevolent, evil, and uh, clearly uh, directed strike that took out a very high-level IRGC, someone who had every intention of furthering the the terror attacks against the state of Israel. My view, a legitimate strike. On the other hand, here you have uh, food aid workers from World Central Kitchen, directed by Jose Andres, one of the true great humanitarians of our time. This is an organization that is trying its best to get food into Gaza. I'm, I'm certain what happened is that that tiny convoy, I think it was only two vehicles, um, probably mistakenly identified as a movement of a high-level Hamas, uh, probably based on intercepts, cell phones. Um, the targeteers uh, did everything they could, I'm sure, to avoid collateral damage. But at the end of the day, the strike occurred, I'm sure, because Israel uh, w believed that there was yet another malevolent actor. But it, it's a moment of... of classic irony on the battlefield. The bad guys take a shot and the good guys, in this case, the aid workers get shot. Um, a tragic I'll, outcome. I'll come back to the bad guys in a second. You just used a term of art, targeteer. Who are they? Who are the targeteers? Yeah, these are, sure, these are very high level, typically um, Navy captains or Air Force colonels uh, who are themselves aviators who have typically uh, conducted many of these missions themselves. They get pulled up to higher headquarters to analyze every single target release. And the, the campaign in my mind here is one that I directed, the campaign in Libya uh, 2011, which was directed at, by the United Nations to go after the forces of Muammar Gaddafi. The targeteers are small group um, operators, they are aided by typically a uh, judge advocate general who examines all this. Um, often you have uh, individuals who have, who have experience on the ground, shall we say, intelligence operatives. I'll leave it at that. 
um, and they look at each strike in excruciating detail. Uh, this is not World War II bombing campaigns where thousands of bombs are being dropped in a single day. This is looking at the precision guided strikes. Um, the targeteers are the ones who make the recommendation to the commander whether to take a shot or not. That reminds me, have you seen the Masters of the Air yet, Admiral? Uh, that's what my uncle did for 29 missions, not as a captain, he's a gunner, but I'm just curious if you've seen it yet. Oh, of course, and you know, as a Navy guy, I'm required to say it's almost as good as Greyhounds, which is the destroyer at sea version, Tom Hanks doing the convoys. Uh, listen, both of those groups of people were extraordinary heroes. Masters of the Air is absolutely brilliant. All right. So now we're talking about targeteers and we're talking about the ones who decided we're going to hit the Iranian embassy. And that's a big step, Admiral. Can you unpack the significance of that for us? Because embassies are sovereign territory. That means Israel struck Iran yesterday. Absolutely. And I think that that was a strike that undoubtedly had to be approved by the prime minister, uh, certainly by the minister of defense, probably by the entire war cabinet. Um, it is a, an, a absolutely an act of war. Um, the reason the Israelis would get to that moment and decide to take that strike is pretty obvious, and that's that they're already de facto in a war with Iran, which has again and again and again stated that their primal desire is to destroy the state of Israel and kill every Jew in the world. So if you're on the receiving end of that kind of uh, war mentality, I think it is not a hard step to get to the point of taking out a very high level leader. Final thought, um, this was not like striking the Chinese embassy. You gave that example a moment ago, which was a mistake by the United States. We didn't intend to do that. This was, uh, by all accounts, a deliberate strike. And I think it, it stands and is legitimate under the laws of war. When you were running the Libya campaign, did you have any errant strikes? Uh, we did not have anything that approaches the, the level of what tragically occurred yesterday with the aid workers being killed, or frankly, the United States. You may remember, Hugh, during the a debacle of a withdrawal from Afghanistan. We oh, yes. took out a father and his family. He was merely trying to get some water to his family. We thought it was a bomb maker. The United States took that shot. These tragedies happen. During the campaign in Libya, I can't recall one, but we dropped probably 25,000 precision guided strikes. I'm sure they weren't perfect, uh, but I can, I can assure you of this. Every single strike that we made was vetted, approved at at least a three-star level by the Joint Task Force Commander, a Canadian Lieutenant General, don't forget, NATO operation, and uh, was backed up by uh, American targeteers, the best in the world. All right, now let me turn to what this means going forward. Iran is functionally at war with Israel because they are, Hezbollah is Iran, Iran is Hezbollah. The same is not true about Hamas, so it's almost true. But Hezbollah is Iran, and they're Shia, and they have been shooting at and killing American, uh, Israeli civilians and Israeli IDF forces for a long period of time. If this gets hot on the northern border, and it's already hot, if it goes to full-scale conflict on the northern border of Israel, do you expect the Israelis to hit Iran? Uh, not initially. I think that if the, uh, if the Iranians unleash Hezbollah, as you well know, they have over 100,000 surface-to-surface -surface missiles that pose a truly existential threat to Israel. Uh, if Hezbollah moved toward a massive set of attacks, uh, Israel would begin by responding and taking out uh, much of that targeting and uh, missile structure in Lebanon. Uh, however, uh, if if the Hezbollah landed strikes, major ones against uh, big Israeli cities, think Tel Aviv, Haifa, uh, perhaps Jerusalem itself. Uh, in that case, I think Israel would strongly consider going after Iran itself. 
Uh, let's hope we don't get there because down that path is a much wider war and almost certain U.S. involvement. So I, you know, Admiral, I heard we, yesterday on one of the podcasts, I think it was Dan Sonor talking to Haviv Redinger, that Israel almost has no choice because the Hezbollah keeps firing the directed missile into the window where they killed a mom and her son having breakfast, that they've got to move them back behind the Latani because rockets are diff the, the, the precision guided handheld munition that goes in a direct line is very different from the rockets that Hamas is using where they don't know where they're going. They've just got to move them back. And so he thinks it's inevitable, your assessment of that inevitability. I think uh, Israeli military planners are looking day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute about their options. And certainly one option would be for Israel to mow the lawn north and just clear out anything that, that has that point to point uh, short uh, distance that you're talking about. The ballistic missiles, the longer range ones, to get at those, you'd have to go deep, deep into Lebanon. I don't think Israel wants to go there yet because they know it means a wider war. And is, they, is there already a target set for Iran? Do you think the IDF already knows the or We got less than a minute. The, the number and order in which of targets that they would strike in Iran if they did that? 100%. All militaries... Uh, in the end, are big file cabinets full of plans. The Pentagon is one huge file cabinet full of plans to strike our adversaries. All right. Uh, Admiral Stav, always good to talk to you. 2054 in bookstores now, available at Amazon.com, available at BarnesandNoble.com, available at Admiral Stav's own website, 2054. You want to know what the future of warfare looks like? Read 2034, then read 2054, and the next one, and you'll know. You don't have to wait for it. Preview of coming attractions, and they're not fun.